In this episode, we'll take a look at the Zoom F3 audio recorder. There is a lot to cover here. I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the pros or the things that I see as very positive about this. We put markers down here, chapter markers, so if you wanna jump ahead, by all means do that. Let's jump in. First up, the Zoom F3 has two XLR inputs with very low self noise, minus 127 dBU EIN is the specification, and it is a two track recorder. In our practical noise performance, Tests, if you want to call them tests, they're more like a, just a measurement. This is recorded with a Sennheiser MKH416. And what I do is I record some dialogue. I leave a silent portion. I normalize the dialogue to minus 23 LUFS. And then I measure the max RMS of the silent portion. And that came out to minus 73 dB full scale. That's actually quite good. These preamplifiers are good from a self noise standpoint. The thing that is unique about the Zoom F3 is that it records in 32-bit float format. It records a wide dynamic range, so it can record really, really loud sounds and very, very quiet sounds, even if it clips. Even if it goes above 0 dB full scale, you can actually pull that down and fix it in post. Here's a demonstration. I made three recordings with the Zoom F3 and a Sennheiser MKH416 microphone. This first one, we had the amplification level set to times one. Second one, the amplification level was set to times eight. And on the third one, the amplification level was set to times 1024. Now, if you know anything about digital audio, you know we have a massive problem here. This is going to sound entirely distorted. You would also have a pretty serious problem here with most digital audio recordings because you didn't set the gain high enough. And so you could boost this up in post, but the problem is, is you would massively raise the noise floor as well. Let's demonstrate how 32-bit float works around those problems. So in this first recording, it's obviously way too low. This was the times one amplification level. Watch what happens when I boost up the levels here in post-production. I'm just using Adobe Audition here. I'm gonna boost first by 15 decibels, that's better. Another 15, that's a total of 30 decibels. And there's 39 decibels of gain. This is what it sounds like now. In this first recording, I have the amplification level set to times one before we started recording. I'm recording into a Sennheiser MKH416 at probably 10 to 12 inches from my mouth. I'd... Okay, now this is the part where normally we would have a really noisy, the, the noise floor would raise way up. It would be really prominent. You'd hear all, everything in that room. <laughs> Not a great sound. But if we did it with 32-bit float like we did here on the Zoom F3, we're seeing it sit at minus 67. So we're doing pretty well there. Let's go to the next recording here. Minus 60 and below usually is great. Here's the times eight amplification level. We'll go ahead and boost this up here. There's 15 decibels of gain and another Oh, four. So that's about 19 dB of gain. It now sounds like this. In this next recording, I set the amplification level to times eight before we started recording. And this is probably about where I would normally set the gain on a 24-bit or 16-bit recorder. Okay. And then the noise floor over here, coming back over here to our amplitude statistics, is sitting at about minus 72 dB. Very good. Okay, let's go to this last one here. This is what terribly clipped audio sounds like. It is horrible. Next up, we're recording with the amplification level set to times 1024. That's what happens when you set your input level too high on most traditional recorders. But the great news is that here on the Zoom F3, watch what happens if I pull this down in post. There's a... Uh, drop it down by 33 dB. Let's go about right there. And this is what it sounds like now. So here I am, you can hear the table creak a little bit as I lean forward. I'm right up on the front of the mic and it is pointed just at the corner of my mouth here. This is a Sennheiser MKH416, unreal, 
on a regular recorder that doesn't do wide dynamic range audio 32-bit float recording, you would never be able to recover that. But we did on this one. So if I take a look at the noise floor here, over at Amplitude Statistics, we're sitting in at minus 81. So we're doing really well in terms of the noise floor as well. So that is the magic of 32-bit float audio. And in these cases, it can be really helpful for those of us that are operating lots of other things at the same time, like doing the camera, directing, interviewing, doing the lighting setup, everything else, and also recording audio. If you happen to set the amplification level wrong, it's not a problem. In post, you can generally fix it. You can record up to 192 kilohertz for sample rates. And what's unique about the Zoom F3 is that there is no gain setting. You don't set gain, which is really a different concept for those of us that are used to recording audio by setting an input level or gain setting or a trim setting. You don't do that on this. All you have is what is called an amplification setting. You can set that beforehand. It's actually not changing how much the analog preamplifier is amplifying the audio signal that's coming out of the microphone. Instead, what it's doing is that it has a hard set gain setting that it's using that's optimal for this preamplifier. And then it can record into 32-bit float. It has two analog to digital converters. It takes the audio in. One of the converters takes care of the loud sounds. One takes care of all the quieter sounds. It combines it together. And between the two of those, it's able to capture a very, very wide dynamic range. And by wide dynamic range, what I mean is really, really loud and really, really soft sounds all in a single file. So it is really interesting. You also don't have traditional meters on this recorder like you do on most. It doesn't have a meter that tells you where you're coming in as far as dB full scale. It has a waveform that you can see and you get a general idea. You can put headphones on and <laughs> listen and get a general idea. But basically what they're doing is they're making it so you don't have to worry about setting the input level or gain whatsoever. Now, it's not quite so simple as that. If you are using this for live audio, like a live stream, you are still going to have to set the amplification level. The amplification level, if you set it before you start the recording, actually affects how the audio is recorded into the WAV file, the audio file. If you set the amplification setting higher, it will record it at a higher level. And if it goes above 0 dB, no problem. In post, you can pull it back down. It's not something you have to worry about like you traditionally have to worry about it with digital audio. The amplification setting also affects the analog output and the headphones. So if you are doing some sort of live stream, for example, and feeding the audio from the Zoom F3 into a camera or into a live switcher or something like that, it the amplification setting will affect how loud the audio is going out. In that case, you do have to care about how loud you set it because if you set it too high, it will clip because those other devices can't handle a dynamic range quite this wide. Now, once you change that amplification level, after you've started recording, it only affects the, the output and the headphones. It does not affect the recording level to the SD card within the unit itself. So really important to keep that in mind. This is a very different type of approach to setting up an audio recorder. Now, as I mentioned before, it is a two-track recorder. It can record a total of two tracks, and it has two inputs. You can set it to mono or stereo. If you set it to mono, both microphone inputs will be recorded to both a left and right channel. If you set it to stereo, input number one will go to the left, input two will go to the right. So just so you're aware of that setting as well. If you're doing live, you probably want to set it to mono. If you are doing something that you're going to do some sort of post-production on and you want to keep the two inputs separate because you want to process them each individually, you can do that by setting it to stereo. Now, some of the physical features of this recorder. First of all, the body itself, the black part is plastic and then the gray part is metal. So all of the corners are protected by metal. Really good build quality, it feels like. Like most of the other Zoom F-series recorders, I would say the F1, eh, this is probably better than the F1. But the F6, F4, F8, F8n, F8m Pro, this is in that category generally with a really solid metal that surrounds the plastic siding. There is a mounting point, a quarter inch mounting point on the bottom that allows you to attach this to camera rigs or sound rigs or anything that you want to attach it to with a quarter inch screw. It also has these belt loops so you can attach it to a belt if you wanted to do that or even a wrist strap. So it's, it's really quite small. You could do something that looks a little bit like that. 
powering. The great thing about Zoom recorders is that they tend to be very good at being efficient with power, and that means your batteries will last longer. In the case of the F3, I plugged in a condenser microphone. Uh, specifically, it was the Rode NTG5. Plugged that in, started a 32-bit float recording, and the batteries, which were two lithium-ion rechargeable batteries, lasted for six hours and eight minutes. It does take two AA batteries. That's one way to power it. The other way to power it is there is a USB-C port on the side, and you can power that with a USB battery bank, or it can be powered by a computer. That's quite good. If you compare that to other recorders, that's a really good result. Now, that USB-C port can also be used to set the Zoom F3 up as an audio interface for your computer. So you can play back the audio from your computer through the headphone jack on this, or you can record to your computer via USB. And it is a 32-bit float or 24-bit linear uh, audio interface when you have it connected to your computer. Now, while you're using it as an audio interface, it also has a loopback feature, which means that you can play back audio from the computer or host at the same time that you're recording, which is really handy. So if you are singing along to a song, you can make that happen on this. It also has a direct monitoring feature so that when you are using it as an audio interface, rather than have the audio go into the Zoom F3 over USB to the computer, back to the F3, and then play back in your ears, you can actually hear it directly from the F3. That reduces any issues that you might experience with latency. If you've ever tried to record or listen to yourself with uh, latency over USB, and there's a lot of latency over USB depending on the device, it can be very disorienting and you'll end up sounding like you're under the influence of something. While the screen is very small, it is monochrome as well, but it is very bright and it is easy to see pretty much in any situation, including outdoors, in direct bright sunlight. It does record on micro SD, SDHC, and SDXC cards up to one terabyte in size, so you can record for weeks on this thing. It does also have an optional Bluetooth add-on. It's basically like a little, I don't know if I want to call it a dongle, it's like a card that slides into the side here. That runs $40 US and that allows you to control it via an app on iOS or very soon on Android as well, which is kind of nice. In addition to that, it also allows you to connect to an Atomos UltraSync Blue timecode generator. So that will allow you to do some timecode recording with the Zoom F3. So there's some limitations there with the UltraSync Blue. We'll come back to that in the cons section. There's a 3.5 millimeter line output which allows you to output audio at line level or at microphone level. So if you're connecting it to a hybrid camera, then you can send, it only has a microphone input on those cameras, you can send a mic level signal. If on the other hand, you want to send it over to a mixer or a switcher, like a live stream switcher at line level, you can do that as well. So very versatile there. And new on the Zoom F3 is that the output has a limiter on it as well, which is really useful because, again, this recorder is 32-bit float only when you're using it as a field recorder. And what that means is that if you do exceed 0 dB, the output is still analog, so it will start to distort if you do go above 0 dB full scale. So if you are doing something live or you are sending the audio over to a camera and you want to have a good recording in the recorder, which can do 32-bit float, wide dynamic range, but you don't want it to clip, if it does go above 0 dB in the camera or in the live stream switcher, there is an output limiter here, which will prevent it from clipping. It'll essentially pull those levels down really quickly so that that doesn't happen. Really, really nice feature. There's a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack that supplies up to 50 milliwatts per channel. What that means in practical terms is you're going to want to use Headphones that have a low impedance, that's going to be more consumer-oriented headphones as opposed to audiophile or reference headphones with something like a 250-ohm impedance. Uh, <laughs> it's, just, it's a small device, they're being very power efficient, and so you're going to want to stick with headphones with a very low impedance rating. We did some RF immunity testing, which is to test to see how much radio frequency or wireless activity around the recorder would affect its recording. Sometimes on the more consumer-oriented recorders, you're going to find that if you've got a wireless signal near the recorder, it'll start to pick that up as digital noise. So um, I did some testing here, and I didn't find any sort of problems, and that was both with LTE, with Wi-Fi. Then I turned Wi-Fi off, made a voice call. None of those seem to make any sort of difference here with the Zoom F3. 
So, so far things look good on that front as well. Of course, a huge advantage to this recorder is it's tiny and it's lightweight. Here are the specifications here. Uh, makes it really convenient for certain use cases where you need to have something that's really, really small. There's a one-year warranty and the price comes in at the time of this review at $350 US. Now, no product is perfect. And I'm going to list some cons here. They may or may not be cons depending on the situation that you're recording in. So let me just run through those really quickly. First of all, there is no quarter inch combination jack. So they are XLR only. There's also no 3.5 millimeter input. So if you need that, you're going to have to adapt the cables and get them to XLR to bring them into the F3. So just be aware of that. Again, not gonna be an issue for some people, but it is going to be an issue for a few. The battery door on the back of the unit is plastic and not particularly sturdy. I could foresee this being the first thing that breaks on this unit, which is disappointing because the overall, <laughs> the other aspects of the build quality are very impressive, but that one thing. The Bluetooth add-on is a, it's a weird thing. I don't understand why they keep doing that, but I think it has probably something to do with cost or potentially with tax issues. I don't know, but whatever the case is, it's a $40 US add-on. I guess the good thing is if you don't want it and don't need it, you don't have to pay for that. So that's good. But if you do want it, it is an add-on. It's $40 plus it is held in place by friction. I haven't had it pop out yet, but it's only held in by friction. That's a problem when we talk about cables like USB cables. They're only held in by friction, especially especially like USB micro and stuff like that. But <laughs> um, it hasn't been a problem so far, but I, I just need to call that out. The belt loops can get in the way of mounting this if you're going to try to mount it on something flush. Um, there's no way to get these out of the way. So you do have to be aware of that as well when you are mounting it to a camera rig, for example. You might need something more like a magic arm to do that as opposed to trying to mount it to a flat surface. The headphone amplifier seems somewhat colored. It seems to emphasize the high frequencies a little bit more. And it's, again, not particularly powerful for driving higher end headphones with a large impedance rating, you know, above 100 ohms, for example. So just be aware of that. That's not, again, not going to be an issue for everybody, but know that what you're hearing in the headphone amplifier is not necessarily as good as what is actually being recorded in the recorder. The buttons all work. I'm just not a huge fan of them. They, I feel like I can work a lot faster on other recorders like the Zoom F8n, F8n Pro, the F4. Um, even the F6, I could operate a little bit faster than this, but I would prefer other types of controls. When you have the F3 connected to your computer or an iOS device as an audio interface, you cannot also record in the recorder's SD card at the same time. So it's at this point in time, it's at firmware 2.0. That may change in the future, but as of this firmware, it's not possible to do both at the same time. If you have a time code workflow, this has an option, and that is the UltraSync Blue if you have the Bluetooth add-on. The problem with the UltraSync Blue from my point of view is that it doesn't work with a lot of cameras. So it works with phones and phone apps, a few phone apps, uh, camera apps, but it doesn't work with a lot of regular cameras. <laughs> so its use is somewhat limited from my point of view. So I don't see this as really being a strong timecode type of recorder. So if timecode is central to your workflow, then this is probably not your best choice. If you need any more information on what time code is and how it works, another video up here where we demonstrate that. The max input level on the preamplifiers is plus four dBU. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, that what that means in practical terms is that if you're gonna be recording really loud sound sources with a sensitive microphone, a condenser microphone, or any, yeah, any sort of sensitive microphone, it's possible that you can still get distortion. Despite the 32-bit float, the multiple analog to digital converters, the magic of the F3, it can still distort if you're recording really, really loud sound sources. So if that's your jam and that's something you're doing, be aware of that. This is not the best spec, and we'll talk about some other recorders that can do a little bit better than that. And then finally, a note that we mentioned a little earlier, I just want to make sure people understand this, is if you do get this recorder and you're trying to figure out why, why are the levels not changing, 
on my recording, when I've started a recording and then I change the amplification level, you have to set the amplification level beforehand, before you start the recording, to control what levels the recorded audio is recorded at. Any changes you make to that amplification level after you are recording do not affect the recording level. They only affect the line output level and the headphone levels. So just so you're aware of that, that's a little bit of a funky thing. I don't entirely understand why they did that, but um, that's how they've implemented it. All right, summary. I love the little F3. I think it's an amazing recorder. Is it perfect? No. Is it amazing for $350 US? Absolutely. It is tiny. It has two great inputs. The preamplifiers are quite good, quite solid. And I think it's interesting that they made it so that there's no need for a gain control whatsoever. Um, you can record really great quality sound with the Zoom F3. And I really am impressed that they have essentially created a new recording category of recorders. It's just, it's really, really impressive. So if this is something that fits your workflow, I think it's a great option. Now, let's talk about what kind of situations it's good for and what situations it may not be good for. So for example, if you need more than two microphone inputs, this is probably not the recorder for you. If you need 3.5 millimeter inputs, you can get adapters and make it work. But if you're gonna be doing that regularly, I don't know that this is the right recorder for you. It's not made to operate from a sound bag. In fact, it's supposed to be even more convenient than operating from a sound bag. You can attach it to your belt. You can attach it to your wrist. Uh, it's really tiny and that is super convenient, but it's also not the right piece of equipment. For example, if you're going to be doing, if you're going to be a production sound mixer for a film, uh, this is this is probably not you're going to be your main recorder in that situation. If you need more outputs and if you are doing sound for film and video, sometimes you do need more than one output. For example, if you need to send a wireless feed of audio to a director or a producer or a script supervisor, this is probably not the recorder for you. If you're doing a lot of live sound with multiple inputs, multiple people, and you want auto mix capabilities because that can save you a ton of time in post-production, that's where something like the Zoom F6 is probably going to be a much better choice for you than the Zoom F3. Now, what are good situations for this recorder? If you need to keep it really, really light, you only need two inputs, and uh, you need something that's tiny, easy to work with, this is a great option in that case. If you're a solo operator, by that I mean you operate camera, you do the lighting, you're directing, you're maybe interviewing, you're also operating sound, all of those things, something like this can be really useful for you. You can feed this audio, you, actually you can mount it to your camera to make your overall package smaller, but it is, it's just a really convenient way to do things. And if you happen to set the amplification level wrong, it's okay, in post you can fix it. So really convenient for those circumstances. If you need to do what's called a bag drop, for some reason you're going to be recording something that you can't be there to control a recorder. A lot of times we see this in films when we have someone going off in a car and doing a little scene in a car. Um, you can just put the recorder in the car. It's very tiny, easy to hide, and you don't have to worry about the actors getting too loud because it can handle that generally. Another question people have asked is, what about this versus the Tascam Porta Capture X8, another recorder that came out recently? that has 32-bit float wide dynamic range recording capabilities. Well, the F3 obviously doesn't have the built-in microphone, so if that's important to you, then the Porta Capture may be a better choice. The F3 has much better battery life than the Porta Capture. So whereas the Porta Capture, I was getting about four hours on a set of four AA batteries, with the F3, I get about six hours, just over six hours, with two lithium-ion rechargeable AA batteries. Obviously, the F3 has fewer inputs, but if you only need two, not a problem. The inputs are XLR only on the F3. There's no 3.5 millimeter input either. So if those are important to you, then Porta Capture may be a better choice. There is no beautiful, large color touchscreen on the F3, but for audio recorders, does that really matter? Some people like it and that's fine. You just make a choice, whatever works best for you. I think the preamps in the F3 are better. The quality seems better. The self noise seems better. I prefer the preamps on the F3. Are they night and day difference? Eh, not really. Um, but I do find that the Zoom F3, at least in terms of self-noise, I think are a little bit better. I would say the Zoom F3 is a little bit more specialized, more special purpose, than whereas the Porta Capture X8 is really meant to be kind of a Swiss Army knife, does everything kind of recorder. So depending on what you're looking for, if you want something that does a whole bunch of different types of things in different situations, 
Porta Capture X8 may be a better choice if you're looking for something that's very small, compact, svelte, um, <laughs> then the Zoom F3 may be a better choice. What about the Sound Devices Mix Pre versus the Zoom F3? If we're talking about the Mix Pre 3 Series 2 versus the F3, well, there's a massive price difference, first of all. <laughs> but they're also a very different class of recorders. I think the Sound Devices Mix Pre is probably a little bit more versatile and it's bigger, it's kind of formatted in a way that would work in a sound bag, whereas the F3 is meant to be much smaller, um, operated from a belt or a wrist strap. And it's only, you know, if you only need two inputs, then the F3 could be a better choice for you. However, the F3 does not have the 3.5 millimeter input that the Sound Devices Mix Pre does. The Mix Pre also has time code uh, with an inbuilt time code generator in the Series 2 version of it. So if time code is central to your workflow, that's where something like the Mix Pre or the Zoom F6 or the Zoom F8N Pro would be better choices. The headphone amplifier on the Mix Pre is, I think, better, much more neutral sounding, and it can supply more power per channel. So you can use better headphones on the Mix Pre. There is one other factor that's really important if you are recording really loud sound sources, and that is that the Mix Pre can handle input levels that go up to plus 14 dBU, whereas the Zoom F3 can handle input levels that go up to plus four dBU. So if you're recording something that's really loud, then you're gonna have a little bit more headroom. You can record something that's a little bit louder with the Mix Pre versus the Zoom F3. So just something to keep in mind if that's important for you. I would say for dialogue, the Zoom F3 is by far sufficient. It's when you're going to be out recording jet aircraft and stuff like that where you, probably the Mix Pre has some advantages. Of course, it depends largely on your microphone as well. So this could go on forever. Let's go ahead and cut it there. <laughs> if you have any questions, go ahead and leave those down below. If you have not already subscribed, make sure you do that. And we'll be sure to get you more great videos on how to improve your lighting and sound for video. Talk to you soon.